Okay, yeah, I think this is more than enough PS4 for me today, thank you! Hang on, wait, it, it, this is an RPG? Good god, I mean, what do we name ourselves in a game like this? I know, Sucky Flop. That's who we are. And what does Sucky Flop look like? Time to go for a walk then, Sucky Flop, here we go! How does this game work? I don't know. Stop asking me. You walk into an enemy, stamina bars appear, you wait for yours to be full, and then you attack with whatever weapon you have one single time, and then wait for the whole stamina bar to recharge. Sony, the PlayStation Classic was one thing, but this is taking the mick a little bit. What do you even call a game that looks like this? Oh, I know. Skylight Free Range 2 Gachdween. You know when game developers tell you that they don't add women into their games because the animation and modeling takes too much time and money? Well, I didn't believe them until today because it was clearly too difficult for this game. Lara Croft and your pyramid chest move aside. These, these are breeds. Happy 2399, everyone. I'll be taking a look at the game that the show was based on. For those who don't know, Skylanders is a series of simple 3D beat-em-up platforming games in the Spyro mythos, kind of like LEGO Star Wars in terms of style and feeling, except that it requires the use of a USB portal device in order for you to place different figures onto the portal and have them pop up in the game. Different figures have different abilities to get by different obstacles and unlock different secrets, and on its own I don't think it's too offensive, it's a cute little idea, but in 2016 when we were constantly teased a crash game on PS4 after 8 years of silence, to then have Sony go on stage and just mention casually, oh yeah, we're working on some remasters, and then go off and show a trailer for a game which had nothing to do with Crash directly, but instead had him as a cameo. People were not happy about this announcement back then. Remember, this was before we had seen anything to do with the Insane trilogy, and after all of the games that had spiralled Crash off downhill. This was Crash's official PS4 comeback, so to see him coming back on PS4 but in a children's toy collecting game was a bit of a bait and switch. But hey, at least the figures are pretty awesome. I love these little things. I also accidentally bought four. Before we get onto the Crash content though, let's take a look at the game as it is. The story of Skylanders Imaginators is that Spyro is having a race, and then evil comes in and stops the race. And by the way, the character design of Spyro makes me wet in a bad way. So I guess it's now time for me to pick up my figures and place them onto the portal. Yippa! Oh my god, it's magic! Look! Look, look who it is! From my toy! It looks weirdly natural here, and since we're in a beat em up, I really love how most of the moves Crash is famous for are translated into fighting moves that can be purchased with the coins that you collect. From super spinning to belly flopping and even sliding, it's all here, just not giving you the same utility as in the platforming games. I kinda like Crash here, honestly. I mean, he's a bit of a chunky monkey, but in this world and art style, he fits in quite nicely. Except for whenever you pause the game. <laughs> Crash, are you having a stroke? Your design, however, I'm sorry, your design is disgusting. Your face looks like a pug that was stung by a wasp. So I'm gonna switch over to Cortex and shoot some holes in it. Throughout the game, you can activate different shrines to give the figures you have new moves to play with. And to be frank, I thought it would be a case of unlocking one universal move for an entire class of figure to use. But as it turns out, you not only get unique moves for each character of each class, but even a unique cutscene of them getting it. This is a level of effort I can respect here. So this is called the Mysterious Ancient Place. And you have a mysterious ancient face. Oh, and before we carry on, I just wanted to mention how cool this little feature is. This here is a gem figure. And not only does it light up when you place it on the portal, I like the pretty lights. But it also allows you to create and store your very own Skylander that has a specific class based on the coloured gem that you have. And this is as extensive as a bloody Bethesda game. Look at this! Individual body proportions, accessories, weapons, skin, and my favourite, the voice. Here's my hero. Do you like her? She's an armor-wearing, ram-horned snake woman with a fire bow, and I called her Fromage. A name that will echo through the ages. So after we pass the first story stage, we're then let loose in the main hub world, which is when we then unlock the entire reason I picked up this stupid overpriced Playmobil set, the Thumping Wumpa Islands. It's its own exclusive level within Skylanders Imaginators with exclusive cutscenes and its own mini story to get through, featuring specialized obstacles and items, nice easy puzzles to break up the gameplay, and even the classic boxes to break for Crash. There's tons of easter eggs, subtle nods and references to the older games, really pretty visuals, and a decent sense of humour to boot. Wow. The real Crash Bandicoot came all the way out here to see my prized crate collection! So it sounds really great so far, right? 
Well, I'm afraid it kind of isn't. This is the slowest thing I think I've ever touched. And I touched the floor yesterday! Look, say what you want about the quality of the gameplay or the ethics behind Crash being in Skylanders after an eight-year gap of nothing. Regardless if you love or hate Skylanders, how can anybody be okay with the slug-like speed you move? Isn't this supposed to be a fast-paced action game for kids? I run pretty quick in the home world, what's going on over here? And I know this is for kids, but hey, the original trilogy were for kids too, and they were never this easy. You just run around and hit stuff with like two or three buttons while doing the occasional jump repeated ad nauseum. It really is baby's first beat-em-up, and that wouldn't be so bad except you move along as fast as cheese on toast. It doesn't matter what extra moves you purchase or whatever, you still end up doing the simplest button mashing combos and nothing else. And often that's the best way to get past any combat encounter because the singular powerful moves that take a long time to wind up don't do as much damage as a quick 1-2-3 combo with your basic punches. And annoyingly, the slowness coupled with the repetitive simplicity is what ends up ruining so many more encounters throughout the game. At this point, you don't have a guard, dash, or roll, just a run, jump, and attack, so tanking hits in big crowds is inevitable. Look, they all move faster than you, and in situations like this, there is nothing you can do other than die and swap out to another figure that you may or may not have on you, the only way to get your old character back being to quit the level or restart it. So I hope you have enough figures, kids, or else you'll need to steal mummy's credit card. This then becomes a huge problem when you're told, Only Crash Bandicoot can unlock this zone. You know what this game reminds me of? Over the head on the Xbox, and if you're reminding me of Over the Hedge, you buggered it up! Now, I'm not completely against the idea of a Toy Story party game that uses motion control. Sounds like it could be quite fun, actually. You know, being inside Andy's room, smacking Bo Peep around for losing her sheep for the millionth time. Can you find me? Okay, alright, we've got a practice mode mini game to start with, and all we need to do is aim while an unlimited amount of pies are flung at Buzz's obese chin. Nice and easy, I've got this one in the bag. Time to start aiming at targets. Oh, oh, wait. Oh dear, no. There's no targets up there. Now, I'm no expert here, but maybe the Kinect can see my hands when they're there, and then. But they can't when they're smushed in together close to my chest. I don't know, I, I mean, I, I, it's just a thought. And I tried using one hand on its own to see if I could get more accuracy, but nope, the game doesn't even register you aiming at anything if you do that. Okay, well maybe it wasn't such a good world to start with. How about we try the space world next? We boot it up and get thrown into another practice mode where we aim an unlimited amount of pies being flung towards... Are we about to play the same game again? Yes, yes we are, you know, because it was just the first time. But guys, it's even better than the last game, because now instead of darts, we're throwing rings. You know what, I think I'm just gonna quit. Oh, you're not gonna quit, are you? Yes I am, Woody, because you're terrible and I hate you. Another adventure mode it is then, animals and friends. This sounds like a nice bit of variety. We boot it up and get thrown into another practice mode where we aim an unlimited amount- I'm gonna quit this one too. Okay, surely there'll be something else to do if I scrap the adventure mode and head straight for the party mode. Lots of different types of fast-paced minigames, one after the other. What could possibly go wrong? Blast off! This is all the game is, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it great? Toy Story Mania is a game where you stand still and vaguely rotate your body by a few degrees while a cursor doesn't follow where you're pointing at. That's the whole game. The Kinect only has to do one job, and even then, it simply can't do it. And the weird thing, though, is that the menus work absolutely perfectly. I mean, it knows exactly when I'm trying to pause the game by holding one arm down straight and pushing the other one out, but has an absolute fit whenever I bend down just a little bit to avoid a pie in the face. Limbs out of frame. What the hell are you talking about? Better with Kinect sensor. If that's the case, then I'd hate to see this game without it. So to summarize, Toy Story Mania works at its best when you want to quit it, which is all you would want to do with it anyway, meaning it's actually the perfect Whoa. video game. Aim for the bullseye. Oh, come on, Woody. Your mouth didn't even say that. It was closer to Aff. Ooh, 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 ooh. Did you know that there is a fighting game on Steam where you get to play as Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I think I just pooed myself. Hello. This is Fight of Gods, and even though the game isn't explicitly about Jesus, who cares? You get to play as him beating the shit out of Moses. So what are the pros and cons of this game? Well, the pros are, uh, it's a fighter, you can play as Jesus, you get to beat up Moses, and the cons are- There are no cons! Just look at how he arrives into the arena. I'm back for the people. Jesus doesn't need to try and get out of his prison. He takes the prison with him and kills you with it. And don't worry, if fighting Moses is a little bit too racy for you, then you can always beat up Father Christmas. Aha! Take that, you bearded nonce! This is for all the years you didn't get me the Hot Wheels garage set. In fact, you wouldn't even exist without me. Where do you think the name Christmas comes from? I am your daddy and you are my bitch! The only problem with Fight of Gods for me, though, is that... 
I blow chunks. It's way too hard for me. And I can't tell if it's because the game isn't very good or I just can't play it right. Every special move I tried happened by complete accident. And even when I changed the difficulty down to very easy, I still got destroyed. <laughs> This game nails you harder than me. Ratatouille. You get it? Cause he rat- We start the game off and we have the worst loading screen I've ever seen. It's nothing but a static chef's hat that doesn't do anything. Come on now. It moved. I need to wash up before I handle the food. So I begin the game running around on all fours with my hands, jumping about, getting a feel for my surroundings, and then- <laughs> Oh dear. You can't touch the- Look. Oh my god, what's this? Is is this a sniffing button? It is! It's a sniffing button! Who put this in the game? Who asked for a sniffing button? <laughs> You smell nice. Okay, so so far this game feels pretty aimless. I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh wait, I get a reward for jumping on this handle? Awesome! Oh well... What a great reward! Death! Eh, I don't know. Is this the way I'm supposed to go? Ah, oh, look at that. I got an achievement for jumping on a stump. You're one of those games, aren't you? Sound design isn't the only problem I have with the presentation, though. What is going on with the floor here? It looks like the floor textures load as Remy runs towards them. Is this texture popping that follows your feet? I've got to carry on, though, so let's just do that. I'm being shown how to carry and place items now. That's pretty neat. The peppers explode! Where the hell am I? What kind of illegal weapon smuggling is this woman up to? Why do her slippers look like Christmas ham? And why does Remy look like Oliver Twist? Please, sir, I want some more. What do you think that jumping on jets of water sounds like? It sounds like this. Not to mention, this is not a very polished platformer we have. I got stuck on grates all the time while climbing them, and oh, oh my god, what is going on here? I'm not a rat anymore. I'm a hybrid between a slug and a sausage. I think I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I'm convinced now. This old bag has some kind of gang operation running. A rat this size heading towards a window that fast would break it. How am I so close to this woman's legs that I'm practically looking up her skirt, yet I'm not dying? And pray tell, why do I activate a mouse trap right here and brush it off like, ah, I'm okay. But then the second a tiny speck of loose gravel gets in my way, I trip over and fall flat on my face. Oh, that's reminded me. After I'm done with playing this game, I've got a great place we can go and get lunch. <laughs> nah, don't worry, you'll love it. Yeah, I've booked a table at Cafe Rat! After this tutorial segment, we then end up on the main game as we search around the city streets of Paris and collect a certain amount of items by jumping around in order to go back to earlier areas and unlock minigames to complete, and therefore progress through the game. You know what other game works like this? Yes, Shrek's Treasure Hunt on PS1, but now, instead of being a stinky ogre, you're a stinky rat. The minigames you have to work with are things like running around a spinning cylinder in the sky trying not to plummet to the earth, or running away on a turntable away from mechanical clumps of Nice. So yeah, nothing too traumatizing for kids. But then again, maybe Remy deserves it. Great! He's a bit of a psychopath. There's my restaurant! That there was the voice of the ghost of Chef Gusteau, your guide through the city streets. And this game will make you remember that, because some genius in the dev team decided that he should repeat every single line of tutorial dialogue for every area and item you walk by each and every time you load in and out of a minigame. The cops can tell you where to find a mission marker. Something more annoying to me than that, though, is the fact that the game itself when you're just running and jumping around the area isn't too awful, but it's completely mauled by tiny flaws that all group together into a nest of regret. It's little things like being able to climb up pipes being a mechanic, but not every single pipe, and things like balancing on tiny platforms with the action button giving you no indication it even worked until you actually land on it. It's not like in something like Sly Cooper where there's a little twirl or grapple animation after you press the button letting you know that everything is about to connect. You only know if your button press worked in Ratatouille if you land on the thing or fall straight through it. There's no clear timing and the actions are incredibly unresponsive. You've just got to mash the action button and hope that you land on the thing. And that's not fun. It's funny. Collect enough of these items and you'll be able to open a tall mission. Oh cool, thanks for letting me know. Collect enough of these items and you'll be able to open a tall mission. Yeah, don't worry, I heard you the first time. Collect enough of these items and you'll be able to- Are you gonna say that every time I pick up a couple of these things? Is this necessary? No, it's not. And then four months later they made another- <laughs> 
why are there so many of them? I didn't massively get the first game, but I still liked it enough. I didn't massively get the second game and didn't like it anywhere near as much. And the third game is now the one that I actively do not like whatsoever. I couldn't stand Fad 3. I think this game is outright bad. Yeah, I'll say it. I don't care. What's gonna happen? A load of kids gonna come after me? I could win a fight against a kid. No sweat. So it's mostly the same deal as the last two games. Security guard, super glued onto a chair, checking cameras and stopping an old boiler from coming into your room. But it's a lot different. For starters, there's only one animatronic, Springtrap. And you don't have to worry about power levels or battery life anymore. But to compensate for that reasonable change, they decided to make everything else you need to survive completely random. The camera feeds that you need to see what's coming, the audio system that you need to lure things away from you, and the very oxygen that you breathe to exist can break down whenever it wants to. You're not in a building, you're in a PS3. And everything in the system crashing every so often isn't in and of itself a bad idea since you have unlimited power. They have to tip the scale somehow after all. But whenever you go over to the console needed to reboot the systems that fail, not only do they take three years to restart, but while they restart, you can't do anything else. Let's say your audio system breaks down, but your camera system and ventilation is fine. That doesn't matter. Once you start rebooting the audio system, you're stuck on this screen until it is done, meaning you can't go back and check the cameras or seal the vents shut to stop Springtrap from grabbing you, all because your giggling child button doesn't work. And if one system is rebooting and another one breaks during that, you can't start rebooting that one until the other one is already fixed, meaning double the time spent on the panel screen, meaning double the chances that Springtrap will kill you or flirt with you. What's he doing here? Ooh, hello. Don't mind me. Then in later nights, everything starts breaking way more often, way too quickly, meaning you have to rely on complete system reboots more frequently, which takes even longer and will 70% of the time be an end to your game. Should you be able to leave this screen while things are restarting? Is my copy bugged? Because no matter what I clicked or where I moved the mouse, I couldn't get out of this screen and I just don't understand the gameplay reason why it would work like this. But Caddy, I hear me asking myself, there's only one monster, so isn't it already easier? I'm glad you asked me, and no, it isn't, because at other points, which again feels totally random, you'll see a hallucination from other games that are better, and Fan 3 gets so self-conscious about it that it decides to break nearly everything at once, forcing you into the same reboot panel again, and punishing you for not doing anything whatsoever. What are you, a nun? Most of Fan 3 is just you sitting back, powerless, unable to do anything, and just wishing really, really hard that Roger Rabbit doesn't show up. Fan for one and two, I didn't love them, but I at least finished all five nights. But here, I didn't pass night three. I just could not be bothered and I could not care any less. It's annoying. Five Nights at Freddy's 3 is a nephew you hate going to see. You tell me that this game is good or scary. I dare you. You look me dead in the eye and... Oh wait, sorry, it's hanging out. Yeah, and you tell me this game is good or scary. It's neither. It's made for people that think Eclair stands for Electronic Claire. At this point, I don't even give a shit about the law. Playing this game feels like being a child, pooing yourself, then your parents grabbing your head and rubbing your face in it. I'm not learning anything, I'm not having fun, and now I smell. All topped off in the end by a casual lean from Fruity Springtrap. And then they made a fourth one. Now, this box art is not very scary at all. You know, woman, hands, those are things that we all have. I think they should have used the Connectimals bot. Oh man, I've got to reach my hand out to the screen to start? Like a zombie? Is good. Rise of Nightmares. Okay, so I bet you were all thinking to yourselves just now, Oh golly, this Connect gadget yes. is a top bit of kit that is certainly worth the money, but can I play a horror game on it? Unless you don't mind swaying back and forth like a drunkard while you spend the first 16 minutes of the game opening the doors of a train. I'm not joking about that, by the way. For the first few minutes of the game, you do nothing but open a million doors. Is this Rise of Nightmares or opening of doors. We control a man named Josh, and if you couldn't tell by his waddling at the very start, he has a drinking problem. The story starts on a train where we do everything that Connect was built to do, including arguing with your wife, walking into a British woman, sniffing an old Romanian man, and crawling under the legs of a Russian ballet girl. We need to chase after our wife after our little argument, but in order to do that, we need our ticket, which I clearly had in my hands, yet the bastard train conductor won't let me through. How do you think I got on this train without my ticket? See? Now, Look, I've got my ticket back, but that meant I had to be told I was going to die by a fortune teller. I don't know, lady. I think my future consists of opening even more doors. I just can't see death coming for me at all. Ooh. Oh, no. Bless you. Oh, no. My nagging wife just got captured by a human grandfather clock. Whatever will I do? <laughs>
Well, well, I won't do that. All of a sudden, a bold man laughs at me because I guess he loves having no hair. The train crashes, we've lost our wife, we narrowly escape by climbing across the wreckage on top of a river, and Josh doesn't sound too upset by any of this. Damn. Didn't think I was that drunk. Ha <laughs> I'm gonna die! Okay. We find the rest of the crash survivors in a cave and do a little bit more drunk wobbling until we fall down a hole. <gasps> Now we have to swim. Oh, dude, it's so scary. We don't need to swim anymore, but now... Ew, we've got icky bugs on our arms. Get them off. Are you starting to notice something about this scary game? That it isn't scary? And I'm getting absolutely sick of these movement controls. Picking things up with your hand is fine, but the game wants you to take a step forward to walk, which would be okay, except you get reprimanded for doing that. What do you mean I'm standing too close? You told me to step forward, you dick! Not only that, you need to shift your shoulders left and right to turn. But since there's a delay to the connect reading you doing that, if it even reads it at all, you can never align yourself straight for longer than a few seconds and are constantly overcompensating your turns. You just wave back and forth endlessly without being able to walk straight. It's enough to make me Wallace and vomit. It literally does not matter that the game recognizes me perfectly and tells me I'm in the optimal play area. You are still at the total whim of this thing trying to decide if you are trying to sidestep or get down with your bad self. And then there's the combat, the lumpiest lump I ever did lump. In order for you to protect yourself from enemies attacking you, you hold your arms up to your face, which is also how you swing a weapon. But the problem with that is that whenever your arms are up, you automatically lock on and focus on one particular enemy that you can't decide and move towards them without any way to turn around. So what ends up happening is you get attacked from behind because you don't have eyes in the back of your head. Unless you're me. Which then means you need to hold your arms up to protect yourself whenever any enemies are around. Meaning you can't control your movements when you need to pick up an important item or weapon after the current one breaks and then you reach the enemy and it's just another round of happy slaps until bad you fall down. <laughs> Sure, they did think about this a little bit because you can raise your right hand above you to auto move you to the next destination. But why on earth would you want to do that? First of all, it's boring. Second of all, it means there's no point playing it yourself. Thirdly, you can't explore. Fourthly, Rise of Nightmares isn't scary. Fifthly, Rise of Nightmares isn't good. And I would love to check out this new game called Deck Splash, but that ended up being cancelled, which I'm happy about because that sounds too much like Dick Splash, so I'm going to go back to Skate. The Skate Trilogy. The thing that makes the Skate games so brilliant is that they don't copy the Tony Hawk control style at all, but give you a control scheme that feels just as natural as Tony Hawk, while at the same time being 10 times more difficult to get right, but 10 times more rewarding to nail once you do get it right. You wanna know how these games work? Okay, you push the board with A, grab the board with your left hand with the left trigger, use the right trigger for your right hand, and everything else is done with the analog sticks. Turning left and right, slowing down and even pumping your body weight up and down ramps to build momentum is done with the left analog stick, while the right analog stick just has a bloody party with your thumb, as you need to pull it back and then flick it in certain directions to perform ollies and flip tricks. Depending on the direction you push or pull the right stick to ready a trick, and then depending on the shape your thumb makes the stick move as you flick it, that's how you perform tricks. And some of the more impressive tricks do feel incredible to pull off once you get the hang of it, especially when building it into a combo. Oh, and you also push the right stick forward halfway or pull it back halfway and hold it to stay in manuals, which, if your thumb is very precise, can also be linked into more combos. You even need to angle yourself correctly and apply the correct amount of speed to your stick flicking in order to correctly land on rails to grind them without jumping too high or too low. But because the physics feels so grounded and the speed realistic, it feels way more natural here than the insanity in Tony Hawk, which needs to make you snap onto the rails or else you'll overshoot every grind in the whole game. The Skate Trilogy takes what is, on paper, one of the most player-unfriendly and insane control stars for a sports game of all time, and manages to weave the impossible into a ruthlessly challenging, yet unbelievably rewarding series of games, and I love them. You get brilliant career modes, incredible soundtracks, some of the deepest customization in a skating game, real-time replay editing with multiple camera angles and effects, tons of stuff to unlock and the main gameplay features and control style just kept getting more refined in each game up until Skate 3 where in my opinion it kind of implodes on itself. I mean I do love the improved camera in that game but 
Oh, this this no good. Skate 2 is probably my favourite from the trilogy though. 1 is a great time, but definitely feels like the first game in comparison to Skate 2. In that game, there's way more to do, it looks beautiful for the Xbox 360, runs at a consistent 60 FPS, and it feels much tighter to play and less loose than the first game. Your board felt like an extension to yourself more than an unwieldy beast that did whatever it wanted. Not to mention, this game gave you the ability to get off your board and walk around when you couldn't skate to certain areas, and you could fail tricks by just tripping over and losing the the board instead of falling flat on your face every single time like in Skate 1. Oh, and how about those multiplayer modes for the party games? Hall of Meat! Oh, Hall of Meat, I'm looking right at you. A local multiplayer mode dedicated to you trying to deliberately outperform your partner in the most painful and insane bails you can while jumping off of ramps the size of skyscrapers. You can't not love this feature. Skate 3 is a good game, I guess. It's basically more of Skate 2 with a few added bells and whistles, but it ended up taking away a few other things and it's glitched Glitchy up the hole. I'm sure you've all seen enough glitch compilations on YouTube to know that little tidbit. Yeah, Skate 3 has the park editor and the x-ray feature when you break a bone after a bail, but the local multiplayer is piss compared to 2. And again, this stuff kind of gets in the way for me. Look at the AI in Skate 3, it's practically suicidal. No other skate game I played had other skaters interrupting my tricks more than in Skate 3. For me, no other skating games feel as much like you're climbing up the ranks in career mode as the skate games. Not only because the missions mirror real life much more unlike Tony Hawk's arcadey silliness, but because the open world here feels as close to a regular location as you would see in real life. Yet, everything has been carefully designed to be skatable, and the speed that you can reach is extremely cathartic. Alright, fine, let's try another one, like Super Crash Battle Adventure. Right, so at first, this game also refused to load, and I was really disappointed because how could you not want to see what is beyond this gorgeous title screen and the game logo in Times New Roman? I kept pressing start, but nothing was happening. I was starting to get really pissy, and not the warm kind, but then all of a sudden after press number 72, we get the PSP version of Crash of the Titans. Yep, that is all that this is. A direct port of the PSP version of Crash of the Titans, but interrupted every 60 seconds with an ad for Victoria's Plums. I mean, if you ever wanted to play the PSP version of Crash of the Titans with touch controls and constant adverts, then you're all set. What? Is that not enough? So, what do you do when you have too many characters to work with? You stick them all in a kart racer, what else? Look, you get to play as all of your favourite characters like Marty, Alex, Shrek, Donkey, and- <laughs> And you had better make sure to spell carts with a Z. So I'm picking the only circuit race that's available to me, all good there. And which character should I be? Hiccup, Skipper, Donkey, Bob, Alex, or Shrek, who can barely fit in his own cart with his knees nobbling out and doesn't even look like he wants to be here. Do you want to know what playing DreamWorks Superstar Kart is like. Very simple. It's Mario Kart, but not fun. The drifting feels terrible, like you're spreading butter on a lumpy bit of bread. And the turning feels as restrictive as anything. I mean, I can forgive a lot of unoriginality in a kart racer, but if the core of the game, the driving, doesn't even feel vaguely fun, what's the point in playing it? Am I driving go-karts or cutting paper with blunt scissors? This is horrible. Oh, and by the way, I just unlocked Toothless. Look at the state of this. Just look at the state of this. Why was this put here? Who greenlit this idea? Why does Toothless look like a long black sausage? And why does he sound like that time you heard your neighbors going at it through the wall? <laughs> This here is 150cc. This is the fastest that DreamWorks Superstar Card will let you go. I thought 150cc stood for your engine power, not 150 crappy creps. Dave Jesus, it's a game on Steam. Steams us. And the first thing the launch page told me was, this game doesn't look like other things you've played in the past. As such, we don't have much information on whether or not you might be interested in it. I can't wait! How do you like your Jesus? Good or simple? I quite like my Jesus to be on the fastest setting. Okay, let's go. It's time to save Jesus. <laughs> the story here is that Jesus has spent so much time saving you that now he's got stuck and needs you to return the favor. Level one, click to get rid of the sand blocks. Okay, simple enough. Did we just murder a Roman centurion by dropping a bundled collection of human skulls on his head? That was metal as shit! And yep, that's basically what you do here. You click on blocks to make a boulder roll on top of Romans and then go, Yeah! 
Whether you use a sack of skeletons, a spiked cannonball, or a rolling obese cow, you just need to click on blocks and hope the physics kill all of the Romans. And no, you can't hit Jesse, otherwise he heads off back to his dad's house for the weekend. My favourite thing in the game though, are the explosives. God, they're so violent. They just launch everything right into the face of everyone. I haven't had this much fun since the last time I sang a hymn with them. Sadly though, I'm getting bored, so I got to this old whiffly Johnny and stop. Uh, okay. <laughs> And that game was You May Nikki, another viral sensation that was actually made in 2004, but I didn't see it get much attention until the same time around Amnesia came out. It's a top-down RPG maker game about a girl who doesn't want to go outside and touch grass, so decides to stay in and play Fortnite. Oh man, wait, we actually get to play this? I didn't know that would happen. <laughs> go on then, let's have it off. Oh. In this game, you go to bed and end up in your own dream world where you have to collect random objects hidden behind every dream door and then equip them to use a toilet. This isn't a traditional gay. Mm, in any sense. There's no real goal, rhyme or reason to what's going on or why things happen the way they do. It's more of a trippy sightseeing tour that you need to find the entrances to. And I know that doesn't sound too interesting, but let me tell you, the sights that you see can get a little bit... You wouldn't think they would get as much mileage as they do with the pixel art graphics, but trust me, they do. Some of the things you encounter and the backgrounds you find are some of the most twisted, freakish things I've ever seen in a game. It can be slow and a little boring to explore the empty spaces, solve the mazes and find these things, believe me, I know. But I would say it's worth sticking through to see what might happen next. Oh no, I'm in a cavity. How do I get out of this warm situation? <gasps> Are you telling me I can walk through a cavity as a flintstone? Are you telling me I can walk through a cavity as a severed head? Are you telling me I can walk through a cavity as a lamp? Yes, you can. It's your life, kid. Stay in bed. Skip school. Wear sandals. Eat a crisp. Go nuts! This is where the horror, if you want to call it that, comes in with Yume Nikki. It's not about tension or danger or scary punishments for not being gud. It's entirely down to its thick, dripping, sloppy atmosphere and how far you're willing to push yourself into uncomfortable territory to see something deformed and frightening like walking into a Walmart. And the music in particular does its part way too well, despite it not matching the mood of the game at all. It's surprisingly funky and jazzy, and yet somehow it works so well. Then you're suddenly running away from a chicken woman, then you're suddenly lost in lamps direct, then you're suddenly following my cousin Leg, then you're suddenly forcing these ugly bellends to cough up blood. Hey Marky, why did you and your girlfriend split up? You want my advice though? Get the bicycle as soon as humanly possible. I don't remember where I got it from, you can figure it out. But it makes getting around some of the more empty and open areas is much less of a chore. Plus, you don't need to listen to the lady's footsteps ruining the mood. Nah, using the bike makes it all ten times better. How did they record the sounds that come out of my parents' room? Hey, hey, look at this. I have a kniff. Wouldn't it be funny if I went up to one of these things and stabbed it? Wouldn't that be so effing effed up? Okay, I didn't expect that to happen. I was joking. I only thought you could- Oh my god, it's another human! Hello, dream friend! You have a lovely room here, and I just so happen to be taking everything that doesn't belong to me, so I hope you don't mind if I mooch around and- Ah! What are you? What is you? What is it? What? Oh Christ, I can't get out now. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Uh, I could stab him with the knife. I'll teach him. Oh. You May Nikki is one of the most unique experiences I've ever had. Not an absolute favourite of mine, I personally can't be okay with the amount of times you have to wonk yourself left and right through laughably thin diagonal passages in a game with only four direction buttons. You know what? It's an unforgettable ride. It's very creative, the music rocks, it's somehow relaxing yet unnerving at the same time. It was made by one guy, it's nearly 20 years old and it's free on Steam. What else do you want it to do? If you wanted it to do anything else, I'm sure it could warm up your Halloween ham. I'm going to take a look at one more Android game that I was able to download and get working. And it's called Super Crashing Bird. Time is nearly up and my pants are nearly down, so let's get this over with. That's it! Everyone!
we've ascended, life could cease tomorrow and we'd all be happy. The crossover to defeat Avengers Endgame finally happened, Crash Bandicoot and Angry Birds. From what I was able to stomach, this is basically the first Crash Bandicoot game remade entirely with this thing, some of the floatiest, gassiest controls I've ever seen, and boxes with the troll face on. At the very least, I was hoping for this bird to look slightly tasty because it's making me hungry, but that's not a bird, it's a hairy hemorrhoid. This isn't a bird I'd like to cook. What? You don't like eating birds? What are you? A vegetarian? I mean, look at it. Look at it! You want me to explain why this is bad? <laughs> you want me to sit here and explain in depth in a three hour critical analysis about super crashing bird? You have eyes, right? And if you don't have eyes, well, I'm not even sorry because if you're playing this, you don't want them. Let this be a warning to every parent all over the world. If your kid asks for a Crash Bandicoot game and you're so cheap that you just download this on their phone for free, don't give that phone back to them because they will grab you and they will kill you. Very existence of Disneyland Adventures for the Kinect absolutely mystifies me. You've got this wonderful and amazing <laughs> motion tracking camera technology to do whatever you want with, and instead of putting Disney characters in a grand magical adventure for you to interact with, you pretend to go to a theme park as you stand in front of the camera pointing in the direction you want your ugly goblin to run towards. Look, there's even crowds of people that block you from moving. See, it's just like the real thing. I always wanted theme park crowds the video game, but it's not all bad because look, they included my favorite Disney movie, The Sniffing Ticket. I fooled! Who'd have guessed that? Okay, I preferred you when you were flat. Is that supposed to be a man made out of a ticket? He looks more like a piece of buttered wood. I don't know, maybe someone somewhere gets their rocks off to this game, but I just don't see it. Yes, finally, I've always wanted a video game where I can go to Disneyland and run around a crowded theme park in real time without any friends, family, shops, restaurants, or actual physical rides. Why does this game exist? Help me, Michael Rat. Let's meet Mickey. Just wave like this. Hello, Mickey! Hello! I was hoping to get some of my friends' autographs today, but I've been so busy with the Toontown mayor election that I haven't had the chance. Wait, why do you need to get autographs from your own friends? Are you trying to sell them on eBay? Do you think you could ask Donald to sign this book for me? I'd sure appreciate it. Oh, right, so I finally save up enough money to make it to the real, genuine Disneyland, and the very first thing that happens when I walk in the gate is the park owner asking me to run errands for him because he can't be asked himself. <laughs> Guess you're a little shy. What are you trying to say? Sure, why not? It's not like I'm a kid that wants to have fun or anything. I'll go and get your stupid Donald scribble. <laughs> Hello, Donald. Okay, and now I've got to run all the way back to him? Fine, whatever. I was planning on running back out the front door as soon as I got here anyway. No worries, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> here, Mickey, I got your stupid autograph and your stupid book. Can I please run around the park now? Actually, this autograph book's not for me. It's for Goofy. Oh great, so I haven't actually been doing you a favor. You told Goofy that you would do something important for him as a friend, gave up without even starting, and then dumped it on me the second I got here. Can I at least get your autograph for me so I don't need to ever see you again? Wow, what an honor. You cheap prick, you didn't even write anything down. When did Mickey Mouse become a sociopath? Did he finally succumb to the darkness? Time to run off back in the direction I just bloody came from to find Goofy and give him his goddamned autograph book. Hello, Goofy, hello. Can I get one for myself while I'm here? Sure. Same as I Right, so Mickey doesn't write down anything at all when I ask him for an autograph, and you sign my book with a pen you pulled out from the inside of your ear. All I need now is for Donald to throw up on me and the Holy Trinity is complete. Okay, so now I've done that. What do I need to do now? I still can't go to the park. I need to go back to Mickey again? Thought I was playing Disneyland, not papers, please. When was being a miserable delivery boy anything to do with going to Disneyland? Do you need to sell your life into the Slave trade to get inside Disneyland nowadays? Oh, there you are, Mickey. What else have you got for me then? A metal bucket so you can send me off to get fresh water from 30 miles away. I've got a present for you. It's your own magical camera. If you like, you can practice taking a picture of me. Holy shit, the narcissism. Mickey Mouse can't even give me a poxy little digital camera without the one condition of taking a photo of him just because he's that damn brilliant. Well, fine. If I must, I must. Oh, and after all of this, guess what we need to do?
Go on. We have to go back to Goofy again, take his picture, because I guess he's such a gangly moron he can't figure out how to hold a camera himself, and then he gives us a map of the park. Oh my god, finally! So after all of that pointless busy work, I can finally fast travel to some classic Disneyland rides. And is it worth it? Absolutely, categorically, no, it is not. The first ride I picked up was Big Thunder Mountain, one of my favorites at Disneyland. And I was expecting some sort of visual show, maybe with occasional things to grab and collect, or a cute video where they put your real life body in the seat of a ride, or maybe even a load of themed mini games where you watch the ride play out in the background. But no, what you get is one of the most exhausting and painful workouts I've ever done in a game. So this is what you do for Thunder Mountain on this game, right? You stand still still, reach out to the left and the right occasionally to hit switches and grab coins, and you do this as fast as possible for three minutes straight without stopping. Yeah, this is your reward for doing all of Mickey Mouse's daily chores. Imagine that one Mario Party minigame where you mash buttons as fast as possible non-stop, but it lasts for three minutes and you're using your entire body instead of just your thumbs. You're supposed to sit down when you get to the ride, not pump up an inflatable sweeping pool. Not even kidding, this single minigame alone absolutely knocked me out for the rest of my recording sessions that day. Even the Kinect itself was noticing that I was struggling and told me to take a break. It was absolute murder on my back, but I didn't want to leave right after that. I mean, I'd already spent about half an hour of running slowly back and forth to get to this point, so I thought I'd give another ride a try and clicked on Space Mountain, another favourite ride of mine. And yeah, fine, okay, it's not as arduous as Thunder Mountain, but they expect you to steer a spaceship around an asteroid belt, avoiding obstacles and aiming lasers without dropping your hands down once for six minutes minutes straight. I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's way harder than it looks, particularly when the game itself is boring and it's more activity than I would have expected from a game about going to a theme park. Look at these pictures. Does it look like I'm having fun? I would rather queue than play this game again. No, I don't mean queue to get on a ride. I mean stand there and queue for nothing at all. Standing in a straight line and doing nothing is more fun than Disneyland Adventures on the Kinect. The Unknown City, Episode 1. Why have you done this to me, Santa? Am I on the naughty list? Ah, Times New Roman, the scariest font. Right off the bat, I know this game is special. Wanna know why? Because when I was checking out the options menu, I accidentally picked English as my language when the game was already in English, and that made all the menu text magically change into lowercase. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the first thing you see after the loading screen. All the are open in the morning. And it gets worse. Here's the voice acting. We are not lost. I know exactly where I am going. This is the voice acting. This is the presentation. And it just keeps getting better. Turning right? No. 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 You know what? I'm with her on this. By all means, turn left instead. You know, where the road stops. It took me five sodding minutes to finally get to a point where I could control the main character. And once I could, Things did not get any better. Look at this vertical sink. Look at these textures. And watch what happens if you stand in front of the lady. Ah! I think this is the worst game I've ever played. And I've got another seven to get through. Oh look, we found a police officer who can help us out. But he's ignoring us and he's looking a little bit hunched over. I guess that can only mean one thing. Help. Help. Oh no, she's been captured. Wait a second, where did the door go? I paid $9.99 for this. <laughs> I'm not going mad, am I? No, th there was definitely a door there. 100%, I'm sure of it. It's how we came into this room in the first place. I'm gonna have to go and see. Let's go back around and check. Ah, yeah, see? <laughs> Look, see? I knew there was a door there. Oh, no. Oh, never mind, it left again. Oh, no. Watch out, everyone. It's your baby cousin running after you after he's filled up his pants. Uncle Fester, nice to see you. Thanks for coming down. I mean, my God, I can't believe this is being sold on the PS4. It's not even worth being given away for free, let alone for $9.99. And it's funny I mentioned that because the exact same game is free on the App Store. The weapon selection menu doesn't work. You move at the speed of a funeral procession. You don't jump very high unless you jump on top of a fence, in which case you turn into an Olympic vault jumper. You can't go inside any of the buildings with items inside. And it doesn't matter where you aim your guns, the bullets just go wherever they damn well please. I'm genuinely appalled this is allowed to be on the store in the first place, let alone sold for any kind of money. And the best thing is that the other games I bought only get worse from here. Oh no, what's that? I'm completely stuck. I can't fight, move, or jump. What's that? I'm dead. Good. I died inside 15 minutes ago. Up next we have Kung Fu Panda on the Xbox 360, jumping back up a generation. But before we get into it, I just wanted to quickly show you. 
a free-to-play 3D online turn-based multiplayer battle game that came out at the same time as the movie. It was called Pose Kung Fu Challenge, and it looks like that feeling you get when you step on Lego. And now the 360 version. Luxo Flux. Yeah, that's right. What? What's right? Welcome, one and all, to the world of Kung Fu Panda, a magical world full of ugly screen tearing, screaming pandas, <laughs> and geese that spin around on invisible record players. Then they break their necks. This game is essentially a hack and slash platformer with light and heavy attacks that you can mix together into combos, special moves that require energy to use, weapons that do immense damage but break very quickly, a guard and a roll. So imagine if Bayonetta was made for five year olds instead of people with the horn. Now aside from a terrible first impression and the jank present in some of the graphics, this isn't actually all that bad. I mean it's simple, it is a kids game after all, but I can think of worse ways to ease a kid into the world of Devil May Cry. There's even upgrades you can purchase in between the stages with the coins that you find, and after one level, I decided to invest everything into a fully powered belly flop. Wanna know why? This snaps the game like a twig. I'm murdering every small enemy in one single flop. But come on, it is incredibly satisfying. Even if you don't want to do that, you can always roll into a ball and bowl everyone over. This is pretty sick stuff, lads. Do you think that a giant wooden hand endlessly thrusting against a wall would be covered in your rent. Overall, Kung Fu Panda, I'm pleasantly surprised. You're okay. You're nothing more than okay, but you are okay. Just like I said to my eldest stepdaughter yesterday, I'm shocked you're not a total failure. <laughs> Oh, mind over mutant. Come on then, let's get this over with. My name is Limes. The first mission of this game is a tutorial gauntlet where Crash's sister Coco sends us off to look for a load of Coco parts and I really don't think her brother should be doing that. After that, I hate to report, it's exactly the damn same game as Titans. No exaggeration, it's the same game, except Crash overdid the steroids in his shins and now he has short shorts. Is that a lump? Oh wait, no, I'm telling a lie. There is something else a little bit different here. There's um, a kid's art pack. What's all of this then? <laughs> oh wow, are these fan arts from children that they hid in the menus of this game just to be cute? Oh dear. Crashes in a mankini. You know what? I'm gonna call it. I don't think this is kids fan art. I'm willing to bet that this was official concept art because holy crap, this is the worst design of Crash I think I've ever seen. He looks like a gangly 30 year old man dressed up as Crash Bandicoot, not actually him. The limb proportions are all wrong. He looks way too humanoid. He's too tall. And again, people complained about Crash 4 or the Insane Trilogy even. Just look at this climbing animation. Look at it. Is this Crash Bandicoot? To be fair to Mind Over Mutant though, even though it is the same game as Titans and the character designs have been left in the toilet, I've got to say, this is basically just a better version of Titans when it comes to the gameplay. From the start, you've got way more fighting moves to work with, including a last minute dodging and counter attack move to really let you get into the combat mechanics and let you think about what buttons you have to press. And you get more moves for all the platforming you'll be doing, the platforming itself being 10 times more interesting and involved than in Crash of the Titans, feeling a lot like Twin Sanity in places actually. Not to mention, hijacking the Titans for fighting has more uses, since they don't only have their own unique special moves that can not only benefit you in combat, but also aid you in exploration and getting to secret areas. Even better, you can jump on and off any titan you want to at any time and store them on your equipping slot and you just need to press the equip button again to get straight back on them, making the flips between combat and crash exclusive climbing and platforming feel way more natural and of the moment. The titans feel like an extension to crash instead of just something that you do every so often. You're not just going through the motions and hitting a single attack button over and over again. This is not half bad. I'd happily play this over Titans anyway, but at the end of the day, it is still a simplistic kids beat em up game, no escaping it, and it's really damn easy. Another person balancing on the other end would make it much easier. Oh, was I... Was I not supposed to be able to do that? And to be perfectly honest, for as monotonous and mindless as this game does inevitably become, I won't lie, I thought it was a little bit worth it to watch all of the cutscenes linking each level segment together. These are the best cutscenes in any Crash game, no kidding. And for each level, they're done in a different cartoon style. There's flash animation, hand puppets, old and timey, and the scripting, voice acting, and characterization is perfect. I'd even argue it's better than what Twin Sanity had to offer in terms of humor. Just check out some of the gags that they somehow got away with here and tell me that you didn't crack a smile. Yes, it is I, Embryo. 
My name sounds like fetus. Call now and you'll also receive neckbeard in a can. Can't talk? Watching monkeys. Look at a monkey. Oh, right in his own mouth. Stare and dream. <laughs> Stare and dream. Soon to be available everywhere but Arkansas. Punch him in the throat. Not my throat. I need that for swallowing. These are all so fast paced, funny, expressive and creative that I'm pretty convinced that Mind Over Mutant was originally supposed to be an animated series or something, but got rejected at the pretense of it being for a character from a video game. And so they were told by executives that they would prefer a video game, so then they just copied and pasted the ideas and mechanics from Crash of the Titans into here so that they could show you all the animated sequences they made. I don't know. I smell a conspiracy here. Oh, hang on. That's just fish. I'm in the market. So I wasn't expecting this in the slightest, but this mini marathon of the post-Naughty Dog Crash Bandicoot games ended on a weirdly positive note. Mind Over Mutant is not that bad. I mean, it's not great. I wouldn't go out of my way to willingly play it again, but it's a lot better than the other toss we've seen today. But overall, when you see the Crash Bandicoot 4 announcement trailer and hear this little exchange at the end of it. How many times have you beaten this clown anyway? Three. Really? Only three? <laughs> Funny. Seemed like more. I can totally understand now why they decided to split the timeline after Crash 3 and pretend like the other games didn't happen. Here we are with Disney Pixar's Connect Rush, a game where you play as a child that ignores everybody that speaks to him. You wouldn't by any chance want to play cars, would you? <laughs> and one day he catches a bus to the Pixar Park in order to go to all these different Pixar worlds in the park and pretend to be in them. I love playing Mater. <laughs> he cracks me up. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not even kidding. This is the saddest game ever made. All you do is run around a theme park, talk to kids, and then pretend to have fun. What kind of shit theme park is this? Where are the rides? Why is everyone okay with this? Where are your parents? Is this Lord of the Flies? So let's take a step back for a second. You are playing a video game where you're pretending to go to a Pixar theme park, but the game itself is you pretending to go to a Pixar theme park. Don't let that turn you off though, because I actually had a bit of fun with this one. Wow, I didn't expect that. In its simplest terms, Pixar Rush is an on-rails platforming game where you travel through multiple Pixar movies and usually means you have to move with your arms like this, but sometimes means you have to move them like you're a drowning dog. There's a few mechanics added in and changed across all the movies to spice things up, and surprisingly enough, not only does this game work really well with reading your running arm motions, leans and jumps than something like Toy Story Mania, but is also 10 times more fun than that game too, even though it's like five smaller games in one package. I didn't like all of it though, like with up where the game couldn't really figure out if I was rowing a boat or having a stroke and on the calibration screen the game was convinced I had scoliosis but overall I'm kind of impressed at how well this all works and you get a lot of variety for your buck too. And so I learned my lesson about buying bad Pixar games and decided to pick up Cars 2 on the Xbox 360. Fantastic. Real good fun. <sighs> Where's my gun? The intro cutscene for Cars 2 shows us a rip-roaring chase sequence and it ends with a cute little crash where a group of cars pile on top of each other and explode. Cars 2 begins with literal car genocide! I was gonna pick Luigi for my playthrough here, seeing as, for some reason, he's faster than most of the other literal professional racing cars and yet looks like an old shoe. In the end though, I went with Lightning because I think he'll kill me if I don't. Once the game itself begins though, I'll be damned, it's actually alright. In fact, dare I say, this is a good racing game for kids and even for adults. This here, this is a good game. It's not even vaguely the same as Cars 1 in terms of racing mechanics. This feels way more fleshed out and looks much more lively and vibrant with more tracks to race around that all look tons better than before. You've not only got a drifting system that's worth a damn, but also a load of new moves to use during the races that add a lot of risk and reward to what you're doing and therefore makes every race interesting even when you're in front. You see, you have this new boost system down here that fills up whenever you take a risk and do some tricky stuff with the right stick. You can flick up to drive up on two wheels and make your steering very limited, flick back to drive in reverse and swap the left and right controls around, and tap A to jump up and over different obstacles and even jump off of ramps to reach shortcuts. Much like in Sonic All-Stars Racing, you can even do stunts in mid-air by flicking the right stick. If you can keep a good streak of these going without using one of the three mini boosts you can save up, once you get your fourth mini boost, you can then activate a massive boost which 
lasts for ages, goes really quickly, and knocks out any other racer around you. You can even get more boost fuel by doing certain stunts through certain highlighted routes, and you can interrupt other racers doing their own stunts by smashing the right stick left and right while driving on the floor. Because you also get races that allow you to use items and power-ups. Cars 2, of all things, arguably one of the worst 3D animated movies ever made, ended up with a good game. I'm sorry, news of the world, you earned that pun. That pun is correct. Recycling? No! This really surprised me, so well done, Cars 2. Which is something I never thought I'd ever say. Okay, guys, we're nearly there, I promise. Dawn of the Dragon on the Xbox 360, also known as Simon Door of the Door. And I guess Chrome Studios weren't trusted anymore after the reception of the last two games, so for the final game of the trilogy, and indeed, the final game in the whole Spyro timeline, Sierra Entertainment hired a new company to make this one. Time to pop this mummer in and bake it at Gas Mark 10. Oh god, oh me oh my, I've got to make another video about these things, haven't I? Okay, here we are, Xbox 360 dashboard, haven't looked around it for a while, but yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> the story of this game is that Spyro and Cinder are trapped in a piss rock and it's time to let them out, but not really because we're also going to trap you again. Why did you let them out? Okay, so right out of the gate, the game looks and runs amazingly, actually. Is that a dodge roll? Oh shit, son, it's a dodge roll. And what's this? Way more crowd control attacks and area attacks to clear out enemies. You can grab enemies now for extra combo potential. Holy shit, is Spyro eating that guy? Spyro can fly. Fly? What? Yes! Spyro can fly! <laughs> Gusts of wind to stop you from flying everywhere you want? Yes! Yes! Quick time events? Hey! Oh my god, is that Hunter? Hunter! Hunter is back! Oh! Doesn't look, sound, or feel even vaguely like the same hunter from the last games, but I don't care. That somehow makes the game good. What's this? A vat of extra platforming challenges based around gliding and climbing to reward you with hidden upgrade materials all over the place. Character switching for entirely new elemental breath attacks that can be used for combat and way more puzzles to solve. What are you doing, Dawn of the Dragon? I like you? No, in fact, I really like you. I can't believe I'm saying this, and I'm sad it's taken until the third game of the reboot trilogy for me to say, but this is legitimately an extremely good game. It's got the balance between explorative collecting that Spyro is best known for, and the combat that the Legend series is best known for, and merges them seamlessly while improving the combat of the Legend series. It really helps how there's like a million new moves to play with instead of the same handful of combos we had before. There's ground combat, aerial combat, grabbing combat, and the Breath combat is tons better. You've got fire, ice, electricity, and earth all unlocked from the start and do even more different things than they've ever done before. Some are great for group damage, some are great for dispersing crowds, some are great for stuns, and some are great for continuous gradual damage. And with Cinder now being playable, you can switch to her whenever you want and pick her elemental breaths. Poison, fear, shadow, and wind. <laughs> too many beans. In combat, you still don't have a lock-on feature, but it doesn't matter because not only do you have a dodge roll to better position yourself to avoid damage quickly, finally, but most of the time the camera ends up being locked onto a scenario and pulled back like a PS2 God of War game, allowing you to see the whole battlefield, making off-screen threats no issue at all, and when the camera control is given back to you, my humps. Look at this. There are multiple large sprawling open worlds with tons of secrets and optional routes to explore with gorgeous music in the background. Yeah, sure, whatever, the game slows down in bigger areas, but it's a small price to pay for what is the most liberating and unironically magical Spyro game so far. This is so good, dude. I'm still gonna prefer the Collectathon stuff. That's just what Spyro does best, if you ask me. But if you wanna shoehorn him into these trendy, edgy bar fights, this is how you do it. This game, man, after all the toss that we've tossed through, this actually warms my heart. Am I dead? In fact, the most recent Pixar game I got was Lego Incredibles, and that was a really good one. Not just as a Lego game, but as a multiplayer action platforming game with puzzles to solve and lots of different things to do, and as a Pixar fan service game. So I think it's safe to conclude here and now that as a whole, I've been pleasantly surprised by a few places with Pixar games. Why don't I take a look at two of the launch titles that came bundled with the Kinect instead? Connect Sports and Connect Adventures. First off, Connect Adventures, which believe it or not, actually has a story mode. You basically need to do a massive series of full body motion quests like river rafting, obstacle courses, ball bouncing, and bubble popping in order to discover and collect these things called living statues, which you can then make bend over. You know what's funny though? 
this actually works. And not only does it work, it works really well. This is the first Kinect thing I have played where I can safely say that if you move your body, it then does a thing. Move your arm, the game moves your arm. Move your leg, the game moves your leg. Move your head, the game moves your head. Move your junk, oh no. Honestly, I'm speechless. And that's really dumb because I shouldn't be considering how simple this is. All you're doing is ducking, sidestepping, jumping, using your arms and feet individually. But because Kinect has such an awful track record with games not working for the bloody thing, whenever you get a game that actually reads what your body is doing relatively well, it feels like the second coming of Christ. And the first coming was already pretty good. Look at that, it even knows when I decide to itch my nose. Or, wait. Do, do I have a nose? Ultimately, it's still as simplistic and family friendly as a pair of shoes, but it's functional. And if some of the photos the game took were of me looking like this, this, and this, then I can't say it wasn't at least a little bit fun. That is except for one thing, the noise that happens when you hit yourself. <laughs> I find that very offensive because my mother died in a car crash last year and the noise it made was no laughing matter. Crush Bandy Fox Adventure. You know what? You should never judge a book by its cover unless it's this one. Let's give it a look. <laughs> well, the game doesn't load. I tried multiple times to get it working, but it just kept crashing right as it opened up. All I get is half a second of a quaint little cabin and an orange hairy truck, then it stops immediately. I can't play this one, and that makes me sick. Up next is The Gunstringer, another early Kinect title for the 360, and one that uses animations from Granny 3D. But I really miss Grandfather 2D! And not to jump the gun here, but this is the most creative use of the Kinect technology I've seen so far in any Kinect game, not just because of its adorably creative live stage puppet show setting with real human hands controlling all the obstacles and props, but because of how it makes a rail shooter work on something like the Kinect. Basically, your left hand moves the gun stringer left, right, and you pull it upwards to jump, just like you're holding the string bar of a real puppet, while your right hand acts as your gunning arm for whenever you find Mel B. But obviously, the Kinect can't exactly pick up teeny tiny individual finger motions, meaning that firing your gun while aiming has to be done in a more user-friendly way. So how how they got around that here is by allowing you to lock onto a maximum of six targets at once for each shot, and then when you're ready, fling your shooting arm back like the recoil of a gun to activate all the bullets that you had locked on with. It isn't perfect, don't get me wrong, especially if your arms accidentally cross over each other while aiming your gun and moving left and right, but it works well enough where I could actually recommend you digging out a copy here. There's multiple types of shooting minigames that are thrown your way, a good sense of humour, a nice mix of platforming as well as shooting. In fact, it's more fun than dropping your kid from a window and making him cry. By the way, I've got a question. Why does that look like an avocado? In conclusion, the gun stringer is a good time, and it's also very round. So why don't we end this marathon off with a quick look at Toy Story 3 on the 360, which, by all accounts, is one of the best Pixar games ever made. It opens up with this fantastic intro stage, playing like a mix of Crash Bandicoot-styled animal riding, Uncharted-style platforming, and Red Dead Redemption 2 train hijacking as we brutally murder a load of aliens by throwing them onto the metal tracks at 90 miles an hour. We also put a load of cows onto a catapult because they're old and I can't milk them anymore. After this segment, you're thrown into the hub world of sorts, and this isn't any old hub world where you just pick levels. It's a massive level in and of itself, set in an old western town that you are the sheriff of. With a million pieces of clothing to collect for your villagers, loads of treasures to find, tons of areas and side pockets to explore, gold coins to mine so you can buy more toys to help you collect more stuff hiding out of your range and unlock more mini games and different characters to control, and residents to help you so that you can unlock more stuff in order to customise the buildings and build more things to play within the town itself. Oh looky here, it's Stinky Winky Poo Pants Pete. This is for all the trouble you gave me in Toy Story 2, you bastard. <laughs> Okay, so Bullseye was an amazing thing to purchase this early on in the game. Wanna know why? He runs and jumps really fast around the town, he can activate specific minigames only he can do which are very fun and give you a good layout of the land around you, and more importantly, he helped me find a townsperson stuck in a well. Oh, yeah! oh okay, well, we beat the mission of finding the guy by just looking at him. Hey man, I was told to come down here to find you, not get you out. But I suppose you look happy enough down there on your own anyway. This mode here properly makes you feel like a kid again, playing with the biggest box of toys you can imagine. It's so much fun. And that's just the sandbox portion. The main story missions are alright too, except for demon baby half face over here. I don't think this is anywhere near as creative or replayable as Toy Story 2 on the PS1, and your movement options are much more limited, but for a game following the events of a movie and taking a few liberties on the side, Toy Story 3 pleases both those looking to go through a varied and satisfying action platforming adventure, and those looking to just take it easy with nice music and throw prospectors into shop windows. <laughs> 
so that you can give them a new haircut and make them leave looking like an angry jellyfish. For as unimaginative as what I'm about to say is, I truly believe it. This is like the ultimate toy box game. I would have loved this game as a kid, but now I'm an adult and completely miserable, so I'm gonna stop. At least I can do the one thing I've been desperate to do since the movie came out and smack Lotso in his stupid face.